how high is the threat that Bitcoin core developers are coming together and, and doing something hurtful to Bitcoin. The main danger is that something gets done without it being noticed. The most amazing threat that Bitcoin ever overcame was 2017 with the block size war. That was that was a big one. Cat was deactivated for a reason. There were some issues with it. Is the Bitcoin base layer kind of done? Like how much more developments uh, will there come? On the base layer, there's still things that, that we can improve. I've done now almost 220 interviews. Um, it's almost a little embarrassing for me. I've never done an interview with a Bitcoin core developer. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that, that should have came earlier, I feel like. But uh, now we're here. Now, now I first, <laughs> you're the first one. Uh, so you will get all my beginner questions also <laughs> as you're the first one. <laughs> uh, you have to dive me, uh, get through that also. And we also, I also want to talk with you about uh, the Human Rights uh, Foundation that you also uh, working with. Uh, it's also really interesting connection between human rights and, and Bitcoin. Uh, I love what Alex Gladstein also is, is doing in that regard. Um, but yeah, let's, let's just dive in. Like, how did you become a Bitcoin core developer and why is that, uh, the thing that you chose to dedicate your life to? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 first of all, I, I was a developer and, um, I was, I was passionate about technology, always, always like to learn new things and, uh, jump into, um, uh, new topics. And, um, so I, I was working with startups for quite a while before really, uh, starting to work on Bitcoin uh, full time. Like that, that, that already like gave me kind of an environment where, um, I could kind of like, always see and understand the full stack of things and, and like see, see kind of how everything works. That, that's something that's also very important to me. Um, and I discovered Bitcoin, um, somewhat early when, when it was pretty new, but kind of really didn't really understand it at the time. Um, I think that's, uh, maybe interesting now that AI is also, uh, the hot topic. Like, um, I, I was like to say, like, I initially, I looked at Bitcoin similar to how you would look at AI. Like I tried to understand how Bitcoin could help a business be more efficient. But of course, that's a very bad way of trying to apply Bitcoin kind of as a tool in the business setting. So that's why initially I failed to understand Bitcoin and how it could be relevant. And that's why, um, I only, I only started taking more seriously and, and diving deeper, um, years later. So, um, I, um, really the, and this, I think it's a good connection to the HRF as well, to the work that HRF is doing, like really what, what like made it click for me was the refugee crisis in Europe, uh, 2015, 2016, when, um, I kind of like, you, you read the stories in the news all the time about people like trying to make their way over the Mediterranean sea or, um, coming across other paths and then relying on, on, uh, human traffickers, um, and human traffickers always take all of the money, all of the values that they have with them. Um, and kind of at that point, I remember that one of the features of Bitcoin is that you could like remember the passphrase in your head and potentially cross borders and, and not, nobody could see that, that, that you have valuables on you basically. Um, and so kind of, yeah, there was, there was really a trigger for me to get deeper into it. And at the time, uh, the lightning network was also very new. Um, and so that's really the first part of Bitcoin where I really dove deep, um, around 2016, um, where, like the, the base layer while I, while I was understanding how it worked, um, on a, on a higher level, um, it also felt like kind of done and like not something where I felt like I could really contribute that much. Um, and while, while lightning was really like, the, the, those were the reckless times, right? Um, that's uh, when you, if to, in order to participate, you had to set up your own node. There was just no other way. Um, and everyone was doing like crazy stuff and, and just, just, yeah, just trying stuff out. So like I, I built like a vending machine, for example, where you could buy uh, Snickers bars with, uh, with lightning. Um, and this, yeah, like it, w it was nice to play around on like application layer stuff, but also um, through lightning, I uh, learned more and more about Bitcoin on the base layer. Um, and yeah, just basically saw more and more how everything relies on, on the base layer. And, um, if we're honest, also everything then relies on Bitcoin core because it's the predominant node that is run on the network. Um, and I was still 
thinking about like working more on Lightning um, when I was invited to come to Chenko to, to New York, um, basically for, for a, a short internship, a residency, like the program is not really active at the moment, but they have like online programs now that are comparable. Um, and there I was in a room with a lot of people that worked on Bitcoin Core. And so I could learn a lot more how Bitcoin Core works in, in a short period of time. And that also uh, really was the first time that I understood it in so much depth that I really saw more and more places where I could be helpful, where I could contribute. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what I started doing then. And um, in the beginning I was like, okay, this is like l interesting learning experience. But then um, after some time I also saw like, okay it feels like i'm being useful here so i will continue to do it um and yeah since since that time so since uh, 2019 um, i've been continually doing it not full time as i'm doing it now like on and off uh, full time like the grand the grand landscape was a bit tricky at times but um yeah now um i'm uh with brink uh since last year um and also supported for some research work from hrf um so yeah i'm doing it full time now for uh, since since early last year, uh, what is Brink really quickly? Brink is a nonprofit that funds uh, Bitcoin development, um, and primarily it's focused on work that is uh, um, on Bitcoin Core. Um, but uh, people that are uh, funded also work on other stuff. So some people, for example, work on fuzzing, and so they do the fuzzing work on Bitcoin Core, but also they fuzz other projects in the Bitcoin space. Um, and for example, I. I'm primarily working on Bitcoin Core, but also I do um, like the Caesar research stuff that we will talk about later that HRF is supporting as well. Um, and I'm, uh, for example, doing some um, tools that, that are helping then with uh, providing data for Bitcoin Core. Um, so the AS map project there, I've built a tool uh, with which you can actually build the maps. Um, so you, you're not really... Um, uh, you don't really have much guidelines in general what you what you're supposed to work on, but um, the primary focus, I would say, in general of the organization is support Bitcoin core work, um, and then um, also, of course, everything that that helps the Bitcoin core, uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem in general. How many uh, Bitcoin core developers uh, are full time or like part time uh, w working on that? Is there like is there an estimate on on that? Can you? Uh... Okay. Is there like a yeah, so um, there is a, a blog post um, that like um, Adam Jonas, uh, somebody from, from Chaincode who is um, working on um, kind of like getting getting kind of the, the status of Bitcoin core development. Like once per year, he puts out a, a, um, a post um, and that features some statistics. Um, so there the bar, I would say, is quite low to for, for what he calls a contributor. Um, so I think he called somebody contributor who has uh, like written five comments or so, or like um, uh, um, uh, in terms of commits, like who has made five commits per year. Um, I think that like includes a lot of people that are not really doing it full time. Um, so since you asked full time, so I would say um, the people that are really doing anything that is close to full time, like actually uh, working every week on Bitcoin Core, um, like I would say, like generally working full time on Bitcoin, and then like every week do something in Bitcoin Core. I would say that is a small group of of like twenty to thirty people or so. So it's really not a big group. And so that I, I also wanted to say that when you said I'm the first one to come to your show or that you that you get on your show, like that's totally fine. Like there's not a lot of people um, that really work on on Bitcoin Core full time, and um, not all of them like to do interviews. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think that's, uh, that's all right. Yeah. F f thank you for coming on. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's my unorganized, uh, invites still now. Like I'm, I just like wh when something in my feed comes and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Then I invite uh, as I did it with you. So when I, <laughs> if I would be a little bit more <laughs> organized with whom I invite and how I should invite, uh, this will come in the future as the podcast grows and as the, the list of potential guests get bigger. Uh, but as now it's, it's just uh, chaotic and in, in my head somewhere. Um,
for all the I, I'm aware at every Bitcoin conversation there is someone new in there uh, and uh, when you think about developers uh, in in a normal project like in a centralized I don't know SaaS business uh, the developers can put a lot in the code uh, and they have a lot of um, yeah, freedom there uh, because they only need basically like maybe one or two people to agree with them and I think a lot of people maybe come with that mindset to Bitcoin core developers and, and think like, oh, Bitcoin core developers, they have a lot of um, uh, power and influence over the Bitcoin um, network. Maybe m maybe let's dive a little bit in the beginning and like um, how high is the threat uh, in your case that Bitcoin core developers, like a group of 20 or 30 people that are actually doing it, um, coming together and, and doing something uh, hurtful to, to Bitcoin, even though they, they don't want to do that, but let's imagine if they want to do that, how high is the threat of doing that? Uh, and uh, what is the role of a Bitcoin core developer in the overall ecosystem in general? Um, so you mean basically that, that the 20, 30 people uh, would collaborate and, and do something hurtful? Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, our, I guess, 20 to 30 is not, I guess, a huge group uh, to corrupt uh in in general like in in the grand scheme of things um but i think like when you when you look at kind of the history of the people of how, how they contribute how, how they came into it where they are geographically um like these are very different people and they they do it for different motivations they have different ideas um and so uh like some of them work together in organizations like, for example, Brink, like there's five or six people, for example, part of that, that, that are um, affiliated with Brink, for example. Um, but uh, like in order to like really catch them all and then not be a canary anywhere, like I, I would have a hard time believing that that's really going to be the case. So um, of course, like in, in such a threat scenario, like more is always better. Um, and of course there, there are the other stop gaps. So, um, uh, hopefully more people than just the 20 to 30 people look at the code and like actually test the code and verify that, that it, the code says what, what, what they are saying. So, I mean, if, if really like there were, were like, let's say like more realistic, like, I think is that two or three people would, uh, collaborate, um, and, um, try to. Put something in the code that is not really like that that introduces a vulnerability right um and so with two or three people like you can you can make it appear like there's like what one person into implements it and the two others are reviewing it and saying like yeah this is fine um but it would need to be covered and you would basically like it, it would really like seem like it's fine um and i think that's a pretty high bar um even like i think you would really need to hide that very, very well um, in order in order to get something in. Like, um, for example, like a change that is just in the test code or like an, a change in the documentation, um, that's something where two or three people would be fine. Like something that is just reviewed by two people or so that would get merged, um, that is possible. But something that touches more sensitive part of the code, like for example, the wallet or something that touches um, P2P, um, that is already reviewed by, by a lot more people, um, and requires more people to say, okay, this is, this is all right. Um, and then if you look at consensus score, like consensus changes, like Taproot, for example, was, um, reviewed by, I don't know, 20 people or so. And these were also a lot of people that are not really active in Bitcoin core, but that came into Bitcoin core just to look at this particular code change and, and give feedback on it. So I think. Like core has a good understanding of which changes are more dangerous than others. Um, and then depending on how many, uh, how, how dangerous they are, um, there's a requirement for more people to, to look at it. And also, um, sometimes with interesting changes, also people that have maybe not been active for a while, but like maybe attaches code that they have introduced like five years ago. And then they become curious, like, why, why does somebody change my code that I wrote five years ago where I had very clear ideas why why I did it this way. Uh, like maybe they come back and take a look at this as well. Um, and there's also like um, people, or or if they don't see it themselves, like maybe somebody else asked them, like, "Hey, you wrote this five years ago, right? You can see it in the in the history in in Git," um, and ask them to look. 
um, then um, they can um, they can be activated basically and and asked to to give feedback as well. So um, yeah, so I mean, like you, I think the the main danger is that something gets done without it being noticed. Um, like once it's noticed, um, I'm not sure if that's clear to to everyone who's listening, but like once it's noticed, of course, like everyone can can run their own uh, fork of Bitcoin Core, and so if it turns out like part of the developers are corrupt, um, then uh, a new fork would get done and then people could run that version of the, um, of the software rather than, than the, um, than the corrupt, uh, corrupted version. Uh, yeah. And I think that's the, the, that's the biggest thing. Like, even if there's something coming in, you can run your own node, uh, you, you can choose your own version, uh, and in, therefore like a lot more people, uh, look actually at, at Bitcoin than, than just the core developers in, in, in that regard. And if there would be something in there that would, as, as we know it, uh, things spread fast in, in the Bitcoin community, uh, and especially something that would maybe even be a threat to Bitcoin that would be highly discussed on, on every, uh, platform. And I think, uh, I always look back a little bit when, when I see threat models to the Bitcoin, like, uh, for me, the most, uh, amazing threat that Bitcoin ever overcame was 2017 with the block size war. That was, that was a big one. Uh, and, and I feel like Bitcoin is now quite stable and, 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 and I, I feel very safe with Bitcoin. Like the, the, the overall thing where I'm like, I'm learning since four years now really deeply in Bitcoin, especially now with the podcast with every day a new podcast guest. Um, just learning deeper and deeper and learning about all the threat models also. It's like, oh, yeah, it gets more safe like <laughs> every day and <laughs> every new person coming in. Um, but I guess n new people have, have the concern a lot uh, when, when they come in and, oh, they're, wait, there are only a, a few, a handful of, 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 of Bitcoin core developers. Uh, yeah, but this, there's a, a whole yeah. ecosystem to that. Like there's, there are node runners, there are miners, there's uh, the, the ho whole group that are, that are depending on, on Bitcoin and that have the life savings in Bitcoin and they, they would you know, react a certain, certain type if there's, there's the something in there. Like, so like a lot of uh, interesting yeah. things uh, in there to protect Bitcoin. Yes. And it's a good question because the, like, it, it really, like what I said, like really touches on the, the, the most scarce resource that we, that we have in, in Bitcoin Core is review time. Like, um, it would be great if like the average, uh, pull request wouldn't look, be looked at by five people, but instead it would be looked at by 10 people. Um, uh, and so, uh, but unfortunately there's just not enough people. So, uh, but like, uh, we just recently had some announcement of new people getting funded, um, particularly also for for um, stability uh, work and for review work. Um, and so um, th that's great. I see that there there we will see new people coming in um, into the team and that they have a, really a focus also on on reviewing. Um, and I hope that like that will get kind of the average number of reviewers on any given pull request. Um, up and, and yeah, kind of make, make the whole development po process a bit more enjoyable because like if you've ever heard anything about Bitcoin core development, probably it's that it's very slow. Um, and, um, yeah, but I mean, slow is also because it's more secure and like we, we just don't merge anything if there hasn't, haven't been enough eyes on it. So is the slowness, uh, a feature, a security feature in the end? Well, I mean, if it's like, if, if there's enough people looking at a pull request and, and, uh, saying it's okay, uh, within a short amount of time, then it, something can get merged also pretty quickly. Um, but oftentimes that's just not the case. And then it's also accepted that it's fine that a pull request is lying there for months or even years. Like you can see many examples of that in, in Bitcoin core. So let's say, uh, it's more a second order effect of the security mindedness of the project uh, rather than a feature. Um, uh, so yeah, um, it, it just happens to be that uh, when there's uh, not, not enough people there that it feels secure to merge, then, then it's fine to take long. And like, there's no, um, or very, very limited, um, uh, drive or appetite, I say, I would say for, for example, merging something before a release, like we have a release upcoming now, which is uh, version 28. Um, and so there's some new features in there. 
Um, but if there's like, like a new feature and like, it hasn't really gotten any review and like you would drive it, like say like, Hey, let's get this into version 28. Like, let's get it done. Let's get, let's merge it. It's cool. Um, like that is not something that, that, that happens, um, usually like either stuff is very close to being ready or if something like, if there's a bug found, like then it can get like in quickly, um, the, the bug fix. Um, for that, like we, we have some extended period of time for merging bug fixes after we have already closed the door for new features into a version. Um, uh, but yeah, this like kind of like very short, getting stuff done very short term is, is very limited, um, because yeah, limited resources and security mindedness. It's also interesting because you mentioned in the beginning that when you came into this ecosystem that you thought that the Bitcoin layer one, like the base layer is kind of done already as kind of all, already ready. Uh, so you uh, focus more on, on lightning. Um, is the Bitcoin base layer kind of done? Like how, how much more developments, uh, will there come and, and how, how much more developed, uh, ca can that be? And this is, is maybe uh, more development even dangerous to, to Bitcoin? Um, so there's, there's many parts to this. So first of all, like at, at the time when, when I had that perception, it was that, yeah, I really just didn't know enough. Like there's, um, a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, and I mean, like there's this, uh, kind of, you could you kind of hinting, I guess, at the ossification, uh, argument by, by, um, Michael Saylor. So, um, first of all, like, even if you would say, like, we don't really change anything on the Bitcoin core protocol anymore, um, the project, uh, on, on the Bitcoin protocol, um, the Bitcoin core project would still need maintenance in order to function, um, on new operating systems, on new computers that come out. Um, in order to to um, fix potential bugs that are still uh, being discovered, um, so like that that alone um, could could keep the people, the group of people that are working on it now busy also for for the next uh, few years and potentially forever, I would say. Um, then of course there are still things to improve, like not not even talking about bugs, but like in terms of performance. Um, there, there's, we always find new stuff that can be done in a better way. Um, the, the code base also can be improved in terms of like how, um, easy it is to understand. So there's a lot of stuff in there that is still from like Satoshi times in terms of like how variables are named. And then you make a change somewhere and then the variable name doesn't really mean what it was supposed to mean anymore. Um, and so all of these things are also still like, there, there's a lot of stuff that we can still clean up and make it easier to understand for other people that maybe want to come in and start contributing or that want to just review, um, changes. Um, uh, so, so these are, I would say categories that we really don't want to miss either way, even if you kind of like say, okay, the base layer is, is finished as a, as a protocol. Um, uh, and then I, I would say on the protocol itself on the base layer, I think, um, there's still things that, that we can improve, um, so, um, just on the P2P side, like not, not talking about consensus. Um, I think there are very interesting things coming up, um, like, um, the, um, package relay, for example, um, a lot of stuff is, is or a lot of resources are going into, in general, into understanding how the mempool functions, how, uh, pinning attacks can be, uh, mitigated. Um, and this really helps, uh, layer two protocols like lightning network. Um, that is really the main driver for, for this, this kind of work. Um, and so, um, I think like lightning works well, I think, but there's still a lot of issues also that need to be, um, that need to be fixed in order for it to, to really, um, uh, support kind of the, the next, the next wave, I would say. Um, so, uh, this is part of that. And so, um, that is, that is also work. I think that we want to, that you want to continue doing. Um, and then I'm not like, um, the, the, the covenants have been the driver for, uh, potential consensus changes, uh, and that whole conversation in the future. Um, but obviously I'm also working on Caesar, which is another, um, consensus change, um, suggestion. Um, so, um, 
because of what I'm working on, but also in general, I think covenants can bring interesting new features to Bitcoin, um, which will allow us to kind of take the next step of uh, uh, layer twos and like uh, potential scaling solutions that don't re require any trust. Like eCash, for example, is also something that a lot of people are excited about at the moment, but it requires trust. Like there's still the possibility that um, the, the mint that you're using um, goes away or that it uh, starts implementing a KYC. Um, so I think we shouldn't stop uh, there and we should try to to take a next step. So um, and and yeah, we need consensus changes for that. Really interesting. You made the differentiation between P2P and consensus. Is is that different parts of Bitcoin Core? Uh, like what what is that? Um, yeah. So the, I mean, the P2P layer is how you, how the nodes talk to each other, right? Um, and so a lot of things can go wrong there as well. But uh, and so for example, you could like see a network split or so. Um, but this is not uh, part of consensus in general. Consensus is like which which blocks you accept, right? Um, and so um, there is another thing that often like for 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 new people that is uh, maybe a bit hard to understand. But there's a, on the P2P layer we have policy. Um, so policy and consensus are different. Um, policy is more restrictive than consensus um, because when you get uh, send like a transaction, for example, over policy uh, over over the P2P network, and this transaction, for example, is um, yeah, it's 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 paying a certain amount of fee. It pays like one satoshi per rebyte, right? Um, and this this uh, transaction would be fine to include in a block. And then let's say like I sent you another transaction that also pays the same amount of uh, uh, um, uh, same fees, same fee rate. Um, but it's just a little bit different. Like it uses a different output. Like you can you can tweak a transaction, right, With, without really changing it materially. Um, but but you can make a tweaks of a transaction. Like I, let's say I put an op return in there and I just change the input the the content of the op return um, uh, every time. And so then I could send you like tons and tons of these transactions, and they could basically like denial of service attack you. Um, by making it like, like sending you valid transactions, all of these transactions would be valid to be included in a block. But, um, uh, as a node, I don't want you to, to send me all of this data because it's, it's garbage. Like, um, uh, so I don't want to be attacked. And so, for example, a policy rule is that I want, like, when you replace the transaction, when you send a replacement transaction that pays the same fee or like, like I basically ask you to pay a bit more in fees. Um, and we call that paying for the traffic. So I accept like more traffic from you, but then you should also pay for uh, for that in the in the in the um, in the sense of a higher um, fee rate. Yeah. So policy rules that kind of unintuitive, I guess, when when you knew. But the policy rules are tighter than consensus rules. Um, you reject stuff on the P2P layer that you would be fine to accept when it's in a block. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that shows how, how these two worlds are different and, and both are important, but um, P2P layer uh, is still quite a bit less important than consensus. Really interesting. And for, for me, for, it's also interesting, uh, the future changes. I think governance is something that comes up, I think that came up like a lot of times already in the podcast, like five, six guests uh, uh, mentioned it, that it's important that we need to implement this. I never heard someone uh, speaking against it on the podcast <laughs> till now. Um, maybe let's dive a little bit deeper in that. Um, what will it enable and, and why uh, should, why is it important? Or do you think it's important? Uh, co covenants, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so covenants, it's, um, I first of all, like I, I have to say, like I haven't really studied covenants in general and also like the proposals um that are uh, being made like for, for some some time over the last couple of months we had like it felt like a new proposal was coming up every week um and uh, so i i cannot really speak as an authority on this because i haven't i don't feel like i have spent enough time on it so uh all i can say in general i think that there is very interesting use cases and people that work on interesting layer twos um, see it as a potential 
improvement uh, for for them to continue their work and for them to to put their ideas into a reality. Um, and from the downsides that I've that I've seen uh, being laid out, um, weighing against the the upside, I think it's something that is worth that to do. And uh, for example, th this is a kind of recent development. But for example, um, the Rusty uh, Russell has put out this. Um, uh, great script uh, restoration uh, project or presentation. Um, and so he basically suggests um, uh, reactivating OpCat um, and also a couple of other opcodes, but OpCat is kind of like the blockbuster opcode that, that people are very excited about. Like if you're on Bitcoin Twitter, you certainly have seen something about OpCat probably in the last couple of weeks. Um, but really the, the main I would say that the really the important part or the part that really uh, kind of excites me about this proposal is that he also spent some time in like under, like suggesting how it can be made safe because like there's always with OpCat, like OpCat was deactivated for a reason. There were some issues with it. And um, so there's really like w people were talking about features a lot, but not really like how we can make really the use of these new opcodes safe. Um, and basically what, what Rusty has done is um, he has suggested a new kind of way of evaluating of how computationally um, expensive these opcodes are. Um, and so this is then a consensus change. Um, uh, but like we, when we look at Bitcoin script, um, uh, right now there, there are also rules in place um, and they say, okay, like I want to, um, I allow a certain number of basically computation, like um, I, I allow some kind of amount of computation that I need to do in order to uh, validate a block. Um, but at this point, it's too much. Um, and right now, we're mostly doing this around uh, signatures. So signatures are expensive to validate. And so um, you can construct blocks in a way that there's a lot of signatures that need to be validated. Um, and at some point, currently, the consensus rules say, no, this is too many signatures. I don't want to do this. It takes too much time. Um, and so then a job block is rejected. Um, and so basically what an opcode op op does is it allows more ways to to do this kind of thing, like to, to make it too computationally ex expensive. Um, and Rusty has suggested a, a kind of a way of calculating how expensive is this, and then yeah, suggested also kind of a boundary that we want to introduce of uh, rejecting, uh, what is the point where we reject this? So this is a very important piece, I think, of um, uh, getting covenants to, to, to closer to reality. Um, yeah, and like on, on the features, I think I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm not the right person. Like there's, there's people that can speak for hours about like all of the, all of the great things that, that you can build. I think like there, there, there's a potential that, that it can just take Bitcoin scaling. Uh, what, what I mentioned before, that it can take that forward. Um, and if there's, if there's potentially a path, then we should, um, yeah, uh, leave the door open to, to kind of, um, exploit that. Um, I, I always like to say, like, wh why, why do I not work on eCash personally? Like, why, uh, when, like, before Lightning came around, um, if you had asked me, like, okay, what's the next step for Bitcoin? Like, can we scale it to, um, is, is there a way to, to scale it to um, whatever you say is, like, kind of the benchmark that you want to put to, to Lightning? I would have probably said, no, I, I cannot see a way to do that in a trustless way. Uh, and then, of course, like, people that are very smart came up with Lightning. Um, and so, yeah, just because I cannot imagine what the next step is, um, I would say like maybe somebody who's, who's very smart comes up with it. And, and I can see that there's a lot of people working on that, um, that are very smart. So, um, I would say, yeah, there's, there's potential that something is coming that we don't really see coming yet. Um, maybe, but that, that would be a new breakthrough similar to what lightning did. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's why also I would just say like, let's keep the door open for, for proposals like covenants. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox 
bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody and how to be a secure, sovereign, individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Yeah, I think it, it's really interesting for me, this whole topic. I mean, obviously, I, I actually have a software developer background. I was three years a software developer, but I stopped that because I was not good in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was just not good in it and I didn't enjoy it uh, too much. So uh, it's not not something that I pursued. Um, so I looked also in the beginning a little bit into Bitcoin. Oh, can I do something developing? Uh, but as, as developing is not my main uh, thing, it's interesting how how deep that uh, that rabbit hole is and how much how much there is to, to discover even 15 years uh, later. Do you think um, we we might come to a point where we we reach a, um, a, a state where we don't have a lot of proposals where like Bitcoin is already in like almost every hand and we only do some maintenance as you said be before some maintenance some small um, compatibility things maybe some uh, some things like um, we have a small bug that we found and and we do it or will there also come bigger changes um, along the way always as technology always advances and then also the threat models of those <laughs> other technologies mm -hmm. uh, advance and so like Bitcoin also has to advance to always be the most secure uh, and decentralized uh, layer. Um yeah, I mean, like, the, first of all, like in terms of scaling, right, you, you said like th that there's Bitcoin in every hand. I mean, like in order to make that possible in a trustless way, like in, in order for not everyone to have a Coinbase account, like that's uh, something where, where we still need probably these changes, as, as we just discussed. Um, and um, aside from that, um, honestly, can you, can you, can you repeat the last part of the question again? It's, uh, uh I, I was just wondering if we come to a state, uh, ever in the Bitcoin core development, uh, where we don't have to, um, have more developments, new developments, uh, in, in the Bitcoin, uh, code, or if we always have to kind of, uh, get more development going because there is the threat model coming uh, with, maybe with uh, cryptography where we have mm. to uh, upgrade that because uh, supercomputers yeah. can hack that. I don't know what's what's coming. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm uh, unfortunately not the, the tech guy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there, there, there might be, there, there's this question in my mind is like, um, where is Bitcoin development going in like 20, 30, 40 years uh, down, mm. down down the line? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be things always coming up in terms of like, or I mean, I'm not sure, um, but I guess there will be things coming up in the next uh, um, uh, decades that we will need to address. Um, I think in general, that still means that like frequency of like how often we do soft forks um, will still go down. Like we'll continue to go down. I think that's 
kind of unavoidable and kind of like if if it really would need to go up and we would kind of chase uh, against um, new developments of quantum computers or so every every year or so that would be not not a great future i guess um i mean there's always solutions for that and i think um that like it, it's all doable but um i hope that um that's that's not something where we're headed and and that that we can kind of keep up with uh, development of of such of such things like like quantum computers and um um like i don't know some other cryptographic uh, new discoveries uh, new developments um but yeah i think that that there will be things that that will need to be addressed uh, like this is kind of kind of hard to say um honestly like at least like for some quantum computer is something that keeps coming up um and so where where it's not the first time i I've, I've been asked this question um and so even some people have like kind of aggressively asked me that like how i cannot like already have a plan for that when when the quantum computer comes and like implied that that like uh, peter Thiel has one in his basement and stuff um so uh i like i i'm i'm in the camp of um believing that it will not like suddenly happen that that a quantum computer appears and and breaks bitcoin i think first of all i think the 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 um the the researchers don't really agree on how quickly we we might get them or if if we will even get them at all but i think um the that, that this computer is coming um we will we will see it ahead and then we will have some time to react um at least that's that's what i that's what i personally believe um and um yeah so, so these kinds of things were like this is not the only thing that i would say probably will come up in the next uh, couple of decades but um and that they're even like um some some bugs that we will need to address that come in 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 uh, about a century for example like some fields break because we're um kind of overstepping some bounds in terms of like account um so there will be some changes that we will need to address and there's also for example like a the great consensus cleanup which is addressing some issues in consensus um these are uh, attacks that require um very high amount of hash power um, in order to be exploited, but still, um, these are things that we should address, um, simply for security reasons. But, um, yeah, I would say still over, over time, the, the amount of changes, like really consensus changes, um, uh, should be going. Interesting. Um, it, it's interesting for you as an, uh, a co-developer, um, maybe you have a different view on that. And I, I, I frequently ask that question to, to, to different guests to see uh, what, what's going on. Um, what do you think is the biggest vulnerab vulnerability or the biggest threat to the to, to Bitcoin? Yeah, that's, it's a hard, uh, hard question to just, just pick one thing. Um, I mean, one thing is that I think with kind of the, uh, development of like CBTCs and and stuff like in general people don't like people in the Western world I would say at least in developed countries um, oftentimes when when they have a when when things are going well for them they don't really care so much about privacy um, and so they may adopt uh, something like a CBDC and and I mean they they already adopt now like like apps like PayPal and stuff. Um, so, I mean, this is not really directly a threat to Bitcoin, but um, that um, I guess this is more a threat to humanity, right? That uh, like kind of cash goes away, and in general, the sense for like privacy being being valuable um, goes away. And I mean, that should mean Bitcoin should see more adoption from the people that like still value this, but like maybe. Maybe we're heading to to a future where where just people say, okay, like I'm I'm happy with um, kind of my my life without privacy, um, and uh, so I don't yeah I don't really care so much about using Bitcoin and like this CBDC app is working even easier even faster um, and um, yeah kind of so I would say. It's not directly like really something that would destroy Bitcoin, but like I guess for in general for humanity to like not care about the values that that Bitcoin uh, represents, I guess is is 
what I'm what I'm quite worried about. Um, and then I guess um, maybe that's a bit uh, inspired by recent events. But like, yeah, we we've, with the ETFs, we have seen very powerful financial players enter the uh, ecosystem um, combined with um, kind of the, the centralization that we've seen in, in pools. Um, and so this feels now like an environment where both of these things could lead to potential uh, new capital, uh, new new kind of um, period where we get to back to something like the um, block size wars, uh, where there's powerful um, um, players that want to kind of yeah make Bitcoin work the way they want it to work. Um, and so I, it's really hard to say how that would potentially happen. So um, the the centralization of, of pools, like it's very hard to say if that really is something where they want to leverage their power or um, how they would play out, what, what their interests are. That is kind of like the, a big question mark right now. Nobody, as, as, as far as I can tell, really knows um, how that is valuable to them when when they have pools that pretend to be other pools, but it's really their pool. Um, um, and yeah, with the, with the ETFs, um, it's very hard to say like how, how a big player like, um, Blackstone, for example, how they might want to Bitcoin to, to work the way they would like it. Um, so these are really more like question marks, but I guess, so there's not, it's not really a tech scenario that I can, that I can outline now or that I'm particularly worried about. Like, um, when you have billions and billions potentially to spend on, on doing it on, on kind of like, making Bitcoin work the way you want it to work. There's many avenues that you can take. Like you can, you can buy a lot of mining power and disrupt the chain. You can spend a lot of money on marketing. Uh, you can bribe people. There's so many ways, like when you have, when you have a lot of money and power, then, then, um, yeah, there, there's like an almost endless, uh, amount of, uh, ways that you can apply it in order to kind of disrupt the, the, the ecosystem in general. Um, can be can be more or less technical, can be not not technical at all. Um, so yeah, th then it's really like a question of creativity. What you what you what you want to come up with? Do, do you feel like the peer to peer nature of Bitcoin kind of gets lost when we have those big players? And you mentioned Coinbase. Like almost everyone has a has a Coinbase account. Uh, it was also my first account that I opened. I don't have it anymore. Uh, it's it's like most people don't have their own keys. Most people don't take properly their self-custody. Even less people run their own nodes. Even less people have their own mining rig at home or something like that. So most people in Bitcoin just have like a Coinbase account or whatever account on an exchange and, and that's it. And, and they never even experience a, a harder wallet or something like that. So do, do you fear that the the peer to peer nature of bitcoin kind of gets lost and captured by those financial giants um i i mean i guess um it's kind of i guess the the, the same kind of worry that i said like that the, when are, are people in general kind of lazy i would say yes with with kind of privacy stuff um um, but it's also a bit like the, the nature, right? Like if you don't have any worries about privacy, if, if you've never been unbanked, like, I mean, um, you already are busy with lots of other things, right? So you, you probably, you don't have to care about it. And so it's, it's hard for me, like to tell somebody who's just like lives a, lives a worry free life and like it wants to invest some money into Bitcoin and then do, does it over a Coinbase account? Like, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so religious about this that I, that I would like scream at somebody, uh, for hours to, to finally buy a hardware wallet and, and do this. Um, I think it's kind of that you, we just have to be open kind of and like show people what can happen. And I think, for example, if we looked at FTX or any of the other centralized exchanges, like they kind of already make a very good case for why you should have your own keys. Like, Centralization is 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 um, uh, dangerous in in the grand scheme of things, but also it's dangerous for for somebody like like this worry-free individual, right? So, um, um, 
and then it's really up to them. Like, do they feel more comfortable with having the money at Coinbase or do they feel more comfortable with having it on a hardware wallet um, at home? Um, I oftentimes then tell people, especially when they have a kind of significant amount, like just do 50-50, right? Like if you if you worry too much that you kind of lose your seat or that you lose your hardware wallet, like the guy that is still searching for it in a landfill, right? Like then, um, uh, but like how much more likely is that than like um, Coinbase becomes the next FTX? Um, and so then when, when, when you kind of go this like, middle approach, like, okay, like if you do 50, 50, like the max you can lose, if either one of these events happened is, is half of uh, your Bitcoin investment. Um, then there's a very important step that they have at least like done, like the, the gone, gone through the, the, for many people, I would say is a pain still to order a hardware wallet and go through all the steps to, to, to do it. And then, um, uh, get some money off of the exchange, but at least they have now a hardware wallet and they have used it. Um, and they kind of understand. Uh, what this is about, and I think that's that's a good. Uh, I, I would say it's my preferred way for for the people people that are in this situation to to kind of introduce them to this topic and like give them like a practical um, a, like reason to to um, to to get off of an exchange. Um, and yeah, I think does it really get lost? Um, I mean it's it's hard like you have to experience it right and if you're not really a bitcoiner um then it's hard to experience it i would say like um there were in in the conference in nashville there were like twenty five thousand people or so um but i mean like how many people hold bitcoin like millions of americans like have have like some uh, bitcoin at some exchange account probably like not all of them can come to to Nashville and like buy something for Bitcoin there at the at the conference, right? I mean, there's more conferences now. There's a lot of conferences I know, but not everyone has like a merchant that accepts Bitcoin around the corner and uh, or can go to a conference and and kind of experience using it. Um, so, um, I mean, that's just general adoption. Like when when the general adoption comes, like I think more people will be able to experience it, and then maybe they get drawn to this P two P use as well and see the beauty of that. Um, uh, but I would say like it's it's more about keeping the door open, um, and the people that actually have a pain, like if their bank uh, closes their account for for some stupid reason, like they they will come to Bitcoin anyway, and they they immediately see why they don't want to have a Coinbase account and put it on, on hardware wallet. Like there also, we just have to leave the door open and make it as easy as possible for these people to, to, to then onboard to Bitcoin. Um, and, and then I don't really have worries. Yeah. It's interesting. I, it, it's just so interesting for me because like I have friends that are in Bitcoin, have their own hardware wallets, have all the things that the, the, they should do, um, some even like multi-sig and stuff like that. Um, but then there are also friends who are all in Bitcoin, understand why it's important from an economic standpoint, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but then they leave it on exchange. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm frustrated because I make a podcast and I, and like, I, I partner up with like uh, hardware wallets and, and all those things and I promote that. Uh, so I promote basically all services that promote uh, um, more control of your own keys because I think it's a very important point of, of, of Bitcoin. Um, so it, it sometimes feels like a little bit frustrating as someone that advocates for, for not your keys, not your coins. Yeah. But, uh, I, I guess people, uh, some people will always uh, stick to, to that convenient side. And it's important that we have the choice, that we have the choice to be self sovereign. Uh, and uh, maybe there are coming more and more events in the future that people and the race learn from from that and uh, but yeah ftx was a pretty good one like for me it's like if you didn't learn from ftx celsius and yeah. all the other things what, what more should there come like coinbase getting hacked and all bitcoins uh stolen from coinbase that would be a major thing uh but honestly no i i i would even I would even say it's it's a long term healthy thing if Coinbase gets hacked. Like it's it's a, a massive thing that will probably tank the Bitcoin price short term massively. Um, I would pick up all of the, the cheap sats <laughs> that I can, possibly can, and long term maybe it's it's that major event that has to happen that people wake up to self custody. It's 
I don't know. Uh, may, may, maybe we need some cat catastrophe like uh, <laughs> Coinbase going down. Uh, it would also be interesting because now they also hold the the, the ETFs uh, and, and and those things. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's it, it's interesting to think about those things. But as an uh, other topic, uh, as we also also discussed before, because we're already at the one hour mark, it's amazing how the time flies by. Um, you're working at the Human Rights Foundation also. Um, first of all, like why and what has Bitcoin to do with, with human rights from your perspective? So, I mean, first of all, I have to clarify, I, I personally don't work for the Human Rights Foundation. I have a fellowship from the Human Rights Foundation. Um, so, um, that I basically, I mentioned it previously and we will we'll go into, into the details, um, a, a bit later probably, but, um, Caesar cross and procedure aggregation is, is a, a potential soft fork, uh, for the, um, Bitcoin protocol. And, um, I did some work on that. And, um, at the same time, I had already started working on this, um, HRF announced the fellowship, uh, for this particular topic. Um, and so we basically came together immediately and they awarded me this fellowship, um, uh, for which, um, primarily, um, so far what you can see of it is a website. Um, so this, um, caesarresearch.org, um, is a website where I've written all that is basically, um, available about Caesar at the moment. Um, hopefully in a, a digestible, uh, way, if, even for people that are, um, a bit newer to, to protocol, um, uh, development and so this is basically how the connection came to hrf and then um now i'm working with hrf uh, for on on this topic of of CISA. and um um for example um through hrf um i uh, give uh, talks on this topic and kind of promote the topic at conferences um to put it more in kind of the public eye and um yeah, get, let more people know what the, uh, what Caesar actually is, um, just so that, yeah, people actually understand uh, its benefits. And so, but like back to your question, um, I, uh, I cannot really speak for HRF because they don't really have a great overview, I think, over all of the things they are doing. Um, but, uh, like, I think the reason why HRF is very interested in Bitcoin is uh, similar to what I mentioned previously, uh, what, what kind of got me into Bitcoin. And I think why it's also a very good, uh, match between us, um, is that, um, when, when people's, uh, rights are, are in danger, when they are suppressed, um, uh, the, um, all of these, all of these, uh, things that kind of, um, uh, are available to, to the state in general, like, for example, fr freezing bank accounts, um, seizing assets. Um, uh, that is something that people can opt out uh, when they use Bitcoin. Um, and that's why Bitcoin is a very, very great tool for people that are um, uh, doing stuff that in, in their respective jurisdiction is illegal, but maybe for us it's not illegal. Like, this always... Depend, depends on where you are, right? What, what, what is really is illegal and, and what, what the state doesn't like to see. Um, and so, um, Bitcoin is a very, um, is a very, um, important tool for this. And, um, uh, HRF, um, particularly, I think Alex Gladstein, um, is the one who, who started this, um, understood a couple of years ago of, um, what, how valuable Bitcoin is as a tool. Um, and they're promoting this. So they are educating, um, activists in, in the use of Bitcoin. Um, some people, for example, that I've met is uh, from the team of uh, Navalny, um, an anti-corruption foundation. Um, they have been accepting Bitcoin for several years now, um, since uh, Navalny's bank accounts were frozen in Russia. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't have all of the details what, what that kind of triggered them to start. Um, but for them, uh, Bitcoin is a very important tool. And, and there are many other activists that are getting support from HRF uh, to, to use the tool. And HRF is really yeah, kind of kind of promoting Bitcoin as a use for people that really need it. Um, yeah, I I just saw the the website of 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 Caesar is uh, really cool, the green and uh, very simple uh, in the in the design. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like I like that. If I'm on the right one, CaesarResearch.org, I think I'm on the, on yeah, the it's, right it's, one. Yeah, it's, it's it's dark and green. Yeah, and <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're on the right one. Yeah. I, I love the the focus on the content. <laughs> no, no, yes, no crazy, I, crazy I, designs. 
yeah, I mean, I, I also don't like to do, do, do the designs, but also I think it's very important to focus on the content. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, as you said it before, what is Caesar, and you're working on on, on that, and and uh, what's the inv also involvement with the Human Rights Foundation? Yeah, so CISA um, stands for Cross Input Signature Aggregation, and um, if you remember the Taproot soft fork as part of um, Taproot, we also got a new signature type, and that is Schnorr signatures. And Schnorr signatures are um, linear, um, so they, it's it's a complicated uh, mathematical explanation. So I would just just keep it at that. So the uh, Schnorr signatures are actually a bit simpler than the signatures we had previously. Um, and that means you can um, aggregate them together. So you can have um, uh, one signature that that signs a certain message, and then you can also have a second uh, signature that uh, signs a second message. And then you can basically add these two signatures together. So you only have one signature, um, and then you can still validate that both of these signatures sign the, the, the these two messages. So this is a um, obvious why. Um, it's, so I mean, you should can also say that you have to say that these signatures are then also smaller. So potentially these two signatures are the same size as one signature previously. So um, I guess if you understand how Bitcoin transactions work and how why you pay fees and stuff, like you can see where this is going. Um, this is possible to do this on transactions as well, um, and so. The, the proposal um, in, in very broad strokes is that for transactions, we could aggregate the signatures that are in a transaction. So um, oftentimes, or usually you have for each input one signature at least. So let's say you have a transaction with three um, inputs and you have three signatures to sign these inputs. Um, then you could aggregate them to just have one signature and then you have a smaller transaction. And so that means you have to pay less fees um, because yeah, you just take up less space in the block. Um, so that's, that's just generally the basic idea. Um, uh, by the way, this aggregation is also what is uh, being used, um, or this is similar to what's being used in multisig. Um, it's just that there, the aggregation is happening previously. So you aggregate the keys as well. Um, so if you um, think of music or so, um, oftentimes people, um, kind of uh, throw these things uh, together or, or have a hard time keeping them apart with music when you have a when you have a multisig in taproot you aggregate the keys first and then later you also have just one signature but because you have to aggregate the, the keys first there's just one input and one out one, one signature so there's not really something that has to be changed on the transaction side because on the transaction side in in the what you see in the block hasn't changed so this is why why this is um, different um basically the change if if i try to make it as simple as possible like a transaction we 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 would want to have a new type of transaction where it doesn't matter how many inputs it has uh it can just have one signature um would would that allow um we had i think like a few months back with wicked an in-depth talk about utxo management uh and how you should avoid having too small of utxos because then they, they might be dust in the, in the future uh, because mm -hmm. the transaction fees outsize the, the actual value so you would have to pay more uh um more to move the bitcoin than the Bitcoin are actually worth or the Satoshis are actually worth, would that also mean that um, combining maybe um, bigger ones with smaller ones uh, where the trans, uh, where the, uh, the, the, like, let's call it dust when it's like uh, the, mm -hmm. the transaction fee is higher than the, the actual value of the Satoshis there, um, combining more of those with the this proposal, would that then unlock them again and make UTXO management better in, in that regard? Um, I mean, unlocking dust, uh, that like uh, only very limited amount uh, of, of dust. Um, uh, so I would say yes, potentially. Um, but I mean, uh, if, if they're really that, uh, that dusty, then I, I think this, this won't be like, it, it won't be that big of leverage, but definitely what I can say is, yeah, um, the more inputs, like 
the more inputs that are in transaction, the, the better the savings are. Um, of course, and that means like what, what you, what you are saying, kind of like these consolidation transactions. So let's say you have a lot of small, small UTXOs. Um, and, um, currently we have a nice low fee environment. Um, you say like, okay, I, um, I may not be able to spend these when, when, when the next wave comes and like the, the fees are up 10 X or a hundred X. So I want to consolidate them. Um, then this would make this consolidation uh, a lot cheaper. Um, that's interesting, of course, for people that like get donations, for example, or, um, also interesting for, for any kind of business, um, that accepts payment for, uh, not super large goods, um, like, um, company like Bitrefill, for example, um, so gets a lot of on-chain, um, payments, exchanges, of course, get, uh, get a lot of these, um, and regularly do these consolidated transactions. So for them, uh, definitely this is, this is a big, um, lever in terms of savings. Um, but, uh, this is not the, like, I would say the, the, the blockbuster use case. And also, of course, not, not the kind of the reason why HRF is interested in, in this technology. Um, and there's another transaction type on the network where there's a lot of inputs and, uh, that's coin joins. Um, and coin joins are a privacy tool. I'm not sure how much you have discussed it. If I should go into detail what a coin join is. Um, in general, uh, maybe a little bit, we discussed it on one podcast episode. So the chances that <laughs> people <laughs> don't know about it are high. Uh, but yeah, maybe just like quickly what an overview of what a coin join is. Yeah. So just very high level view. A coin join is an interactive, um, way of, of building transactions together. So a lot of people come together, um, and, um, all of them have, a, a UTXO, let's say, um, and they basically combine this UT, these UTXOs, uh, in a safe way into one transaction where, um, all of them, like very simply, like imagine all of them have a control one input. Um, and then at the end, they also get out one, um, output. Um, and so you then, um, the, you, you don't lose control of your funds, but it's kind of scrambled. So, um, before maybe since you, um, finally made the step to get out of Coinbase, uh, let's say you withdrew your, uh, 0.1 Bitcoin that you saved over time. Um, and, uh, but then like, since you, it's clear to anyone on the network, like chain analysis or so can easily see, okay, this came out of Coinbase. Coinbase has your passport and, and everything. Um, and so it's still clear that this, um, UTXO is controlled by you, um, is owned by you very likely, or if not, then maybe you've withdrawn to, to your friend's address or whatever. Um, but, but it's still associated to you in, in, in the kind of the view, um, of the blockchain. Like Bit Bitcoin is not anonymous, it's pseudonymous. Um, and so this, this transaction is still, uh, basically your pseudonym where, where the funds are. Um, and so then you can use a coin join to send it through this collaborative transaction where a hundred other people, for example, are participating as well. And so then afterwards, there's a hundred, um, uh, addresses where potentially it could be yours. Um, and so then you have, uh, an anonymity set of 100 that you're hiding, uh, inside. Um, and then you can also do this over several rounds. Um, and then, um, you can also split these funds, like there, there, um, uh, there are certain protocols to this, um, that both make it safe and that also, um, kind of, uh, make sure that, um, it's not easy to analyze what with, with a certain degree of, of likelihood that you own certain funds. So you can do this, for example, before then you, you finally put, uh, your money onto a, a cold storage. Um, and then you have basically, um, uh, anonymous, uh, Bitcoin again, and it's not associated with you in person. And, um, so this is uh, important because it, um, it allows people that are really for them, for, for who is very important to use Bitcoin, uh, not just because they are unbanked, uh, but also because they could potentially be targeted, um, uh, in, in, in their, in their country politically or whether, whether they are. Um, so, it's not just about like using Bitcoin um, uh, because you don't have a bank account, but also like you need to be able to use it anonymously and um, CoinJoin allows that. Um, but um, oftentimes CoinJoin comes with a certain overhead in terms of like you need to get your money into a wallet that um, allows to participate in CoinJoins. 
Um, and uh, then, like, I mean, th this is not the case anymore. Like, there's been quite a bit of uh, turmoil in, in the CoinJoin uh, wallet space because the Samurai wallet uh, was, um, uh, people were um, apprehended. Um, I'm not sure if they're currently in jail, but they are um, definitely, um, uh, there's definitely court date coming up in a couple of months, I think. Um, and so, um, but yeah, there, there's a certain overhead. Um, and so when, but when we say that with Caesar, um, transactions that have a lot of input become cheaper, um, then also participating in coin joins becomes cheaper. Um, and what uh, Caesar actually even does is that it, it actually makes going through a coin join, um, ignoring a lot of the details, but going through a coin join can potentially be cheaper for you than like just sending your own transaction. So let's say you have your 0.1 Bitcoin, but you also want to buy uh, a conference ticket with that. Um, conference gives you 10% discount on, on, on purchases with Bitcoin. And in general, you want to um, finally be part of the P2P uh, way of using Bitcoin, right? Um, so then when, when you, when you do this payment, you can either send your, send one transaction with, uh, one input, uh, to outputs, uh, um, but you can also send it through a coin join. Um, and that can potentially be cheaper for you, um, than just making your own transaction. Um, just because you participate in this uh, big transaction where um, all of the um, signatures are collapsed and you just pay for one signature, like all of the people pay for one signature versus when, when you do your own transactions, you pay alone for, for you two sig uh, for you one signature. What's also then interesting is that when, when you save with participating coin joins, you also get a plausible deniability. Um, it, it doesn't just make it... Um, interesting for people to use a more private you to use bitcoin in a more private way but um you since you also save um, money doing it um when somebody like kind of right now there's kind of always this like um uh thing like okay like i mean in general bitcoin is just used by criminals uh, but especially when you use coin join in order to um be more private then definitely you must be a criminal right but uh, we can like get away from that uh, a bit more when we say, okay, like coin joins are actually a way to use Bitcoin cheaper. Uh, it's not just more private, but it's also cheaper. Um, and so that, that is also a very nice effect um, that, that uh, yeah, would be great. And that's an interesting uh, argument never heard because like uh, without that, the only fit, only argument for doing a coin join is for, uh, um, yeah, basically for privacy purposes. And, and then the, the state is like, yeah, you, you, you want to hide something from me. You're a criminal. Uh, basically yep. I don't agree with that, uh, uh, opinion, but it, it is, uh, it is what they are thinking. And then if you are saying like, oh no, I just want to save fees. Like uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's hard. So like that, that could have been an interesting, uh, argument uh, for, for that. And it's also really, I could could really enhance uh, privacy for people that want to have more privacy and do those contracts. Really interesting. Thing. Thank you. Um, yeah. Now, last question before we come to the end routine that, that every guest gets: What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think I'm I'm working on Bitcoin Core, and we talked a bit about uh, kind of like what it's like to to work on on Bitcoin Core, and um, I guess I gave some some insights in, into that world already. Um, but uh, in general, I would just say that for a lot of people, Bitcoin Core is kind of like this this black box that they have a hard time understanding or like feel like it's it's. Uh, Something that they they, like, they they just ignore because there's no point in 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 uh, in uh, getting involved or even just following it, being able to understand what is going on there. Um, and um, I would say, like, if you make um, some effort to like go to places, for example, like read um, what an IRC meeting is um, and uh, read kind of the meeting notes and um, Subscribe to to the Optech newsletter where Bitcoin Core pull requests are uh, mentioned and and explained. Um, it is something that I think uh, everyone can can go through, even if you're not technical. Um, and I think it would allow you to learn 
um, a lot about what the protocol is like and kind of what the things that are going on there. Um, and so I would, I would really invite everyone to, to kind of like not, not see this as something that you cannot do. Like it, it definitely is going to take some time to, to kind of get used to it and like kind of get like a basic understanding of what things are that are being talked about. Um, but it's not something that you can, uh, that, that you, that you should be scared of. Um, I would say, um, uh, and um, also something that I would recommend uh, if you're if that's like available to you, um, the uh, meetup format Socratic seminar, um, also often kind of like under the name of BitDevs. Um, if that's uh, available in your city, like I I host it in in my city in Berlin, um, uh, but there's uh, they're available all over the world and in in Germany, for example, there's also German speaking one that are doing it uh, remotely over a Jitsi server. Um, uh, that is a very interesting uh, format to learn about stuff that is going on in, in the Bitcoin space, especially if it's a bit more technical. Um, and so this is also something where maybe if you come there the first time, it will seem like totally overwhelming and you might not understand anything. Um, but there's also my recommendation, just stick with it a bit. And um, just, yeah, you will you will already learn a lot by, by osmosis, basically just, just, just listening just just uh, kind of like maybe afterwards you you search for some stuff uh, later you read some stuff um, afterwards um, and then within like going there three or four times you will start to see like you hear some things again that you heard before um, you start to understand things a bit better uh, maybe you ask your first questions um, and um, so yeah I would I'd like to invite everyone when when you have a possibility to go to a bit of Socratic seminar um, please do that. That's, that's also a very amazing, um, learning opportunity. Really cool. Uh, I think learning about Bitcoin, uh, in general, no matter what aspect, especially also the technical things is so important, especially as we are so early into the game. So, uh, uh, thanks for the, for the, for the, um, uh, tip. Um, now we have the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and your question from the previous guest is an interesting one. It gets in the debate, a uh, store of value versus <laughs> medium of exchange. Um, uh, and he asks, do you think we will first integrate more, uh, um, financial products for store of value, like Bitcoin bonds, uh, ETFs and stuff like that before we come to, uh, a higher adoption of medium of exchange. So like the question is like, um, when, when do we start finding more adoption of the medium of exchange use case? I mean, we touched a little bit on it with, uh, the lightning, um, uh, with the lightning discussion. Um, where do you see the adoption of medium of exchange? Where do you see the adoption with, uh, with store of value from Bitcoin, especially the, the, the whole, financial system coming now in with with uh, the the store of value aspect and etfs and maybe bitcoin bonds and, and nation spy and bitcoin and all those things uh, i i would say like to me it's a it's a bit um hard to answer i guess it's because i think that the store of value use case to me is already kind of at the maximum i would say i mean like more there can always be more people doing it um, but I feel like everyone who wants to do it can do it. And there's not really, it doesn't feel like to me, like there's many ways of keeping people from it. Like it, you, you, if you buy an ETF or if you get a Coinbase account, or if you, if you buy, uh, if you buy a hardware wallet, uh, like th these are things that are open to people. And once you have made the decision to do it, I think you can, you have all of these choices and you can, you can do it right away. So, I mean, it's, um, I would say there's not really that much to do. I mean, like there can always be more people doing it, like more people can, can buy it. Maybe you have an uncle that still hasn't, uh, had any Bitcoin. Right. But, um, to me, I feel like there isn't really much to be, um, to be discovered in, in that sense. Whereas on, on the other side, on the P2P side of, of medium exchange, I think like that's where, I'm, I'm hoping, and I guess that's my answer. I'm, I'm going with a medium of exchange. I, I basically, I hope that we see more availability there, that we see more merchants um, using uh, Bitcoin and accepting Bitcoin payments um, and, and kind of seeing this um, as, a, 
as a way of transacting. I think there's there's like we've already had BTC Pay server many years ago, and that already made things great. But there's also a lot of other um, tools available now that that. Um, and, and, and services that make this easier for you, um, like um, point of sale, um, computers, uh, apps on the phone, etc. Um, there's, there's, so there's really so much choice that really, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm hoping to see this also because um, it's just fun to, to pay for a beer at a bar. I'm, like we, we do this uh, at our meetup, for example, as well, and we've been doing this for a very long time um it's uh, something where it's still kind of strange to me when i come somewhere else and there's like a kind of a like a conference or, or some kind of meetup or so um where it's about bitcoin but then they don't accept bitcoin payments uh, in, in as payment for example like um or for example like i was at a big conference um where people told me like yeah we do offer Bitcoin payments, but really most people here don't really want to spend their Bitcoin. Um, so this is something also where, yeah, it's kind of strange to me because it was always kind of part of it for me. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm hoping for, for that to become more normal than or become as normal for other people as it is to me. Yeah, I think a big part of uh, why people don't want to spend it uh, because if they want to stay on the lawful side they have to uh, pay capital gains tax on, on it uh that's that's a i think a major thing uh, I, th I think i myself would spend it even more when when there would not be tax implications not only because like it costs more than but also the hassle of documenting all that <laughs> all that <laughs> crap is it's like i don't want to document so much so it's uh, i think it's in when you're living in a state where there is um capital gains tax on bitcoin it's easy to just hodl on and and uh, spend your, your fiat income if you have fiat income if you have only bitcoin income if you're one of the the, the lucky uh, people that are already on a bitcoin standard also from earning perspective uh then i guess it's uh, more interesting then it's also uh uh capital gains tax could be could be weird um but yeah i would love to live on a bitcoin standard now i would love to just switch because i'm already 100 percent in bitcoin i only use field to plug <laughs> to, to do all the things uh outside of the bitcoin world uh but my one of my sponsors in the podcast already pays me in bitcoin uh and i try to to pay a little bit things with with bitcoin here and there uh, but it's 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 a hustle with with the taxes if you really want to stay lawful uh, and I try to stay as lawful as possible um, and uh, I think that's a major major catalyst if no capital gains that no capital gains taxes on on Bitcoin exist yeah perfect then uh, let's uh, let's wrap it up um, before I let you go before I can let you go um, where can people uh, find you is there any place on email or where where people can reach out to you or Twitter. Yeah, Twitter is fine. Um, you can just uh, there engage with me. That's that's where we engaged as well the first time, right? So yeah, I'm I'm available on Twitter. Um, I think that's that's probably the easiest way to reach me. Perfect. And thank you so much, Fabian, for for being on. Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening uh, for for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.